Hello and welcome to season two of the Born and Bred podcast. In this season, we talk to some of Northern Ireland's greatest sporting heroes. Kaboom. We want to give a quick shout out and thank you to The Base Project for being our new home for season two. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Born and Bred podcast. Today's guest is a sporting legend in Northern Ireland. Six-time world bike super champion Jonathan Ray joins us. Jonathan, nice to have you here. Nice to be here. Is it Johnny okay or Jonathan? Johnny's good. Johnny's fine. Close off the tongue a bit better, doesn't <laughs> No, it's a real pleasure to have you on today. Um, first of all, me and Cara know absolutely nothing when it comes to the sport, so we're actually really intrigued to speak to <laughs> so you So many questions. Yeah. Um, so what we typically do on the podcast is we just kind of fired across to you and you know, we want to find out where you come from and a little bit about your life. So, yeah, where do you come from? So I grew up in Dutch side of Larne. Mm-hmm. My dad, he was a motorbike rider. And so I grew up around motorbikes. And generally, instead of going to the North Coast for Horse Church Strand, I was going to the North Coast to watch my dad at the Northwest 200. And just growing up around that atmosphere, I was so intrigued by bikes. Nothing else mattered. I went through school, little local country school in Ballinure. <laughs> and then um, went went to Larne as a secondary school, and no school sports mattered. You know, it was just bikes, 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 and um, that was typically not really cool. You know, you got not yeah. not bully, but it's like, who's this idiot away again? He's away to England on the boat. Why is he getting time off on a Friday to ride motorbikes? Like, what's motorbikes? And I was I was pretty sure back then it could I could make that hobby my job. Mm-hmm. Um, but like in every sport, every job every aspect of life it was all about opportunity and new opportunities were coming it's quite an expensive sport yeah my parents are like working class both worked really really hard and with two brothers and a sister i was they were spread thin you know when it came in six when i was 16 years old um a team in uk gave me an opportunity to to race more or less professionally but for free Mm -hmm. um so I went like sofa surfing, you know, staying on mechanics couches and living in England a bit, trying to pursue this as a dream. And uh, about two or three years later, I got my first sort of professional contract and that was it. You know, never really looked back. But it was um, when I look back and think about the traveling we did as a family. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, motorsport typically takes place. I grew up in motocross, so like scramblers, dirt bikes. Yeah. And over here, we'd race every Saturday. But generally, there'd be two day meetings, so you'd have a you know a small camper for us. We had like a long wheelbase Sprinter van that my dad works in you know distribution. So we would upturn a textile pallet, put a mattress on top of it, and the bikes would sit under the the mattress. But then you'd wake up in the morning because the inside of the van would be dripping condensation on your face. <laughs> but the, I look back in them days as like best days of my life. Yeah. You know, like traveling with your dad, like he was your hero. You're racing your motorbike, and um, some of the stories were fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in terms of those like early days, you know, we said like in school, you know, bikes was your thing. Like, how did you cope with that as a kid? You know, because I assume everyone else was football or you know all the sort of mainstream sports. How did you deal with that? At yeah, age? so at Lauren Grammar, it was a rugby school, and you had to do rugby, <laughs> and I had, I had no interest in rugby. I was not. I'm not lazy, but um. If I'm not interested in something, I've mm-hmm. no way. And I was a decent um, out half. And the PE teacher kept telling me, you know, rugby's for you. I was like, you've got no idea what bikes are. And I'm actually pretty good at this. <laughs> um, but I did school sports until third year, rugby until third year, mm-hmm. until it, they played on a Saturday. Yeah. When they were playing midweek games, I played. But on a Saturday, it was bikes. Um, but I was not not a misfit at school. I sort of didn't. Didn't run around with the the cool kids or not the, the cool kids aren't cool anymore. They're bad kids. You know what I mean? Yeah. Think they're cool at that age. Yeah. Um, and you know, coming from outside the time, my mom and dad were always, I wouldn't be allowed to go in and be part of that gang that hung around, you know, the cinema or, you know, street corners with their yeah. mobile phones. I was not sheltered. I was a bit backward, you know, country boy. Um, funny. So. I made friends with the the local farmers and the bus, mm-hmm. you know, and my social life then was not hanging outside smoking at the cinema. It was going to like young farmers events. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it was pretty much like a license to drink underage because it was, um, it was actually really good fun. And I made a lot of friends through that, but then traveling, 
I've obviously missed a lot of and and discipline. Mom, my dad was pretty pretty tough on me as a kid. I remember one infamous young farmers night out and getting home on the bus back to Cowater and and talking to my caterpillar boots trying to get them off. My dad standing in the doorway watching me, <laughs> telling me like what a what a joke I was and I would never make it. And I thought, oh no way. And of course I wasn't a complete disaster. I was very disciplined. But you do miss out a lot on that um let's say normal late teens of growing up. Yeah. You know, yeah. with the, all your other friends were, you know, accustomed to or um your know, lads' holidays, even late yeah. teens, early twenties. But um, you knew from like from the start, you were pretty sure like this is what you wanted to do, and like your parents obviously had a big influence on you as well. And I guess they were probably trying. Were were they tr trying to push you down that as a career path? Not really. Well? No, not really. Because um, one, even at grassroots level, it was pretty expensive. Mm -hmm. You know. You're putting fuel on bikes every weekend and then changing tires to be competitive and then all of a sudden you've got a spare bike because you need one um and it's dangerous you know flip me i've spent so much time in you know the aftermath of what i've done in my life's been great mm -hmm. um but then if I, if I actually quantified the amount of not even hours days or weeks i've spent in hospitals it's ridiculous but you grow up and i think it also helps you growing up not to i and I've got kids now and you want to protect them. But when something happens, you do see it as, listen, this is going to help you. You know, it's these adversities or mm -hmm. this problem you have will make you tougher or will help you. Mm -hmm. Or I feel like it's helped me, not that I'm the perfect package, but I've got a seven-year-old who he screams like he's broke his legs sometimes. <laughs> and he's got a small scratch. Yeah. <laughs> I want to like, I want to grab him and squeeze him and tell him you can't do that. Yeah. You know, it's, you've got to have a pain threshold, but I do feel um, they never forced me into the sport. I, I grew up and I think because they seen how much it meant to me, they they obviously supported that. Yeah. And, um, and I had a bit of potential, which makes it exciting for them as well. See, this would be a really stupid question, but this is what intrigues me. How, at what age can you get on a bike? So I think legally you can start racing here, like motocross at six years old. But my, for example, the little um, battery bikes you uh -huh. can get now, like proper little kids motocross bikes. My boys rode them at like two years old <laughs> before their third birthday. Yeah. Um, and I rode a bike under my third when I before I was three, and it was just. But it's normal, you know. If you grow up with that, that's yeah. it. It's all you know, then, isn't it? Um, we're like. My my wife just sees motorbikes and she sees A and E. Yeah, yeah. And I mean that's what you know that can go wrong and mm -hmm. things can happen. But I just see it as it was such an amazing um, time for me. Not just the riding part of it, but the feeling like motocross is so cool. Like they maybe forty fifty foot jumps, and you're as a ten year old you're jumping them in the air like you feel like Superman. Mm -hmm. Like you're controlling this motorbike and you're. Miles in the air. And, and like, how fast are they going? At the I don't know, motocross bike, how fast? Maybe, you know, 60cc, I wouldn't know. Don't know. 40, 50 mile an hour. Uh, you I know, at, ride that at, at, at seven and eight, a geared bike, yeah. <laughs> I couldn't even ride a bike with tricycle. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's just a different world, isn't it? Really? Yeah, I, but I, I loved it. It's all I do. And the fun part was, like, I was telling you, these two-day meetings, you know, you'd go, especially when you from 10 years old, I did the British Championship. So you generally we drove all through the night. Um, after dad's work, we'd get there in the middle of the night, wake up, do practice and sleep over. And they were brilliant because then afterwards you're, you're hanging out with your rivals or your mates or brothers or riders, sisters, or, mm -hmm. you know, it was incredible. All to rush back up for that Karen Ryan sort of, 12 o'clock boat Happily. and if you missed that you were frigged it was the quarter past four <laughs> you brought back to Larn um, and um, but they were brilliant days you know and I sort of miss it my boys are into football now so they start if a match kicks off at 10 let's say the coach wants there at half nine they've got their training in the week but it's over like that mm -hmm. you know you go there you watch it it's done you're home where motorsport for me was like it's a day long with three races there's breaks in between you know, it's not just about the race and they were, we were building like little BMX jumps for our bicycles in the paddock. And it was like a real, 
fun day out mm-hmm. and then families you know families would come and you'd make your like your sandwich bags and ice boxes it was just really really cool it's like every weekend it was like a camp trip yeah and then as you're starting to race yourself was your dad still racing no well no, i think was he done i think he came i came along started racing at the perfect time for him he says it was the perfect excuse to retire right yeah i mean i think he was really good i mean he was i think he says i don't know he's not he doesn't he's very humble but i I think it's like 13 Irish and Ulster titles he has. And he's won an Isle of Man TT and Ulster mm-hmm. Grand Prix. Like he's, he was good, very good in motorsport. But I was doing well. I think it was perfect timing for him to get out. Mm-hmm. When I say road racing, he was he would do like circuit, like a, like the Northwest like Street, yes, where there's yeah. not huge luxury gravel traps and air fences. It's, it was tough. Yeah. And I would watch videos of my dad racing now and you see there's like a lot of the grid not here anymore because they've, They've crashed badly and they're mm-hmm. they've, they're gone, you know, they're mm-hmm. dead. So mom and dad always threatened me that if you ever, like with anything, drugs was the worst vice. And then it was um, road racing. If I ever did the TT or, or, or the Northwest, mm-hmm. I'd have to find a new house to live in. So they equaled that to like drugs. <laughs> so I was always threatened that if I did these road races, I was like, I had to find myself a new house. So I was never, I was sort of scared away from that. Yeah. But um, I so it didn't push you the other way where you were like, well, I say that's really bad. So I'm gonna, you know, that. I really want to do that. My dad would say that but in the same in the same breath. You know, after a few beers, he would get excited and he would say, "You you want it? You want it? Donington Park this weekend?" But it'll never compare to a TT win. And like, <laughs> I, on ahead. <laughs> so in terms of then your journey, when did you know it start getting serious for you? I guess. Um, I don't know if it's ever got serious. <laughs> I think, you know, um, I've always tried to keep it fun. Yeah. And I've um, I've worked pretty hard. I've been working hard the last four or five years away from the track more than I ever have. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's because I'm getting older. I'm 36 now. Um, or because it's the fear of, you know, you're, you're going to drop in performance. You know, you want to give it everything. Yeah. But luckily I... I got a really good opportunity when I was 16 to race. It didn't cost my parents any money. And I did just okay, just okay to th- to have the main sponsor of the team think, well, we'll invest and give another chance, you know, another year. And who was the sponsor? Um, it was actually um, Red Bull, Red Energy Bull? Drinks Company. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they owned the team. And their philosophy was kind of like they wanted to take – they had it established with three, two riders already and they wanted to make a three rider team and I fit at the bill because I came from motocross, I had no experience and I liked the idea of turning this like nobody yeah. Yeah. into something. So I mm-hmm. um, started off in a uh, 125cc class, it's a small beginner bike if you like, um, two stroke but still can reach speeds of like 140, 50 miles an hour and um did okay, but I was massive. Like I'm as I was as heavy then as I am now. I'm seventy kilos now, and on a little one two five, it was it was like an elephant in a tricycle. <laughs> like I was, I was race. <laughs> I think we all rolled. Are you sort of glancing at your No, I was looking for something. I didn't want to say um, cameraman in a tricycle. It was elephant in a tricycle. <laughs> but. Um, then, and I was racing against like kids, like kids at 50 kilos. So mm-hmm. yeah, you were at a severe disadvantage, but I showed enough potential that they, they merged with Honda UK, like the biggest team in the UK to create like a junior team. And I moved up to the next class, which was 600 cc's, bikes capable of maybe 180 miles an hour, much more technical, but it was inside an official team. And I had teammates that were like household names, you know, the British Superbike Championships every weekend. It's on, um, you know, live coverage for maybe six or eight hours on Eurosport. Mm-hmm. And these guys were like heroes to me. And I was suddenly being allowed to hang out with them you yeah. know, every weekend. And I was absorbed that. Also being part of a great team, I had amazing mechanics. So I learned a lot in a short space of time. And um, yeah, then the second year, in that, I got really badly hurt. Um, my brakes failed actually going into a corner in Scotland, in Knock Hill. 
and I broke my femur, compound fracture in my femur. I thought then that was it over because I was, I'd gone from motocross, which I loved, to road racing. I'd done a season and I was just okay. And after six races of my second season, I was like banged up in the firm in hospital and thought, oh, here it goes. I'm back to, mm -hmm. back to working with my uncle, you know, in the engineering company. And that's, that's it over, dreams over. But in fairness, it was, I don't know whether it's because I had potential or because they felt guilty that they actually nearly ruined my life. They gave me another chance the following year, but on a super bike, a thousand cc bike. Mm -hmm. I wasn't growing mm -hmm. into the size of an elephant, but I was, I was, super bike was the premium class, thousand cc, 200 brake horsepower, the big powerful machines. And I'm at 18 years old, like the youngest by far in the class, and they've given me a chance. In fact, they said it when I was in my hospital bed, and that really gave me motivation to work hard. And, you know, there's so many wives' tales about how to get fit faster. And there was the oxygen chamber therapy, you know? Yeah, yeah. Heard of that, where they, you know, you're in this, like, uh, they treat, they use it for treating divers with the bends. So you're in a compressed air chamber that they pressurize it to, I don't know how many meters below sea level, pump 100% oxygen into it, and supposedly that should heal you. So I was booking, like, double sessions down at Macromorn <laughs> in Larn and I was like living in there every day to get better uh -huh. and you know after eight months of a compound fracture in my femur I was back on the bike testing in Spain my knee wasn't from the first day I arrived my knee swelled up that much that I couldn't um I couldn't bend it Goodness. enough to go yeah. on the bike and I told my crew chief I says please don't tell the team manager but can you put an extra like bit of seat foam on the foam just to lift me up because I can't <laughs> bend my knee because it's such a cramped position you're in. Mm -hmm. I can only liken riding a motorbike to you know, squatting in a gym just from left side to right side for like 36 minutes oh, wow. or less. Yeah. You're, you're constantly just lifting your bum across the seat to the other side for left corners, then to the right. The bike's 170 kilos. Goodness. 200 horsepower so you're having to accelerate and decelerate that and change direction of that you know at really high speed so it's physical sport mm -hmm. you know sometimes when you speak to somebody that doesn't know motorbikes they think well just you just sit on just it, sit on it. It's just your ass. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest i didn't actually think it. only you said that then i would have thought that yeah but like yeah suppose you're actually not sitting on it really are you you're standing no, you're, you're moving yeah constant and the slightest inputs disturb the bikes everything's like finesse yeah so it's you know um it is tough you know it's very tough if i told you my heart rates my um training peak files are crazy and I, I explain it to people my heart rate in a race will be i'm also abnormally high mm -hmm. but for like 40 minutes i'll be above 200 beats a minute wow if i do my if i do my vo2 max testing i can't on a bicycle i can't even produce 197 and I keep you can't get anywhere close my, to it. You can't I keep replicate asking it. Asking my coach, why is this? And he's like, Well, it's it's also adrenaline, adrenaline, and yeah, stress mm -hmm. hormones, you know, and that pumps your heart rate up. Yeah, but it's crazy. Like my teammate will row, he'll run, you know, twenty twenty five beats a minute lower, and then I think, well, Am I just unfit, or am I do I produce too much adrenaline, or yeah. how it is? But it's just the way I was. Yeah. Goodness, yeah, isn't it? And that's something that we talked about as well, and that we wanted to go into a little bit. Like, what does the training look like off the bike, like in the gym, or you know, your strength and conditioning program? Um, what what does that sort of look like? So it's it's probably like every sport that's evolved, and there's always game changes that come. You know, motorbikes was famous in the eighties as rock and roll. You know, probably like football. You know, the George Best era, or whatever. Yeah. And, and now, you know, everyone's like the perfect athlete and they have to be you have to be so empowered to weight matters as well so you have mm -hmm. to be physically strong but as light as possible as light, yeah. so it sends a lot of riders to alley you know there's a lot of not eating disorders but borderline eating disorders you know i've been with teammates in the past that are telling me trying to help me advise me telling me listen maybe not that carbonara or that creamy pasta better this tomato one i'm like my brain wants <laughs> the yeah. creepy past yeah like, yeah like you're gonna you're gonna annoy me uh -huh. it's my performance will be better if i have what i want yeah um but as a typical week if i'm at home a typical week um it'll be two strength sessions 
made up of and the exercise in, index isn't that big it'll be like squats and like push pull exercises mm-hmm. yeah um then very very high intensity um intervals okay and then on the rest there'll be two down days in the week but the other days will be long easy aerobic exercises and that's cycling running um lucky now i started playing a bit of football on a wednesday <laughs> night with um a lot of the dads from the local school my wife told me that they started this group like a whatsapp group because all the moms have whatsapp groups and so there's dad's there's, a dad, no? <laughs> there's a dad's group i said like, do not put me in this dad Don't. and then i found out there's the, it's a, the football dads and i thought oh i i, never, I played football in the playground at school yeah. but and I thought it was okay. <laughs> oh, flip me. So, um, so I'm now playing football on a Wednesday night and loving it. And um, I was thinking, how hard can it be? Like dads, I forget I'm 36 year old. And I'm I'm a dad. Something the stereotype dad is old, fat, and probably grey hair. <laughs> and I'm like, how are these guys playing football? I'll smash them. No worries. <laughs> <laughs> and I turn up and they're like they're bowlers like, they're, <laughs> also something. they're not old for a start they're like they've either played at a really good local level yeah or or some of them have played at a higher level I'm thinking how do I fit and so I'm really fit you know I, I can run mm-hmm. but I quickly realized that I was shit because I'd never get past two for the first months <laughs> <laughs> so now they're just starting to like every time I'm here Wednesday night I play and I cross my fingers before because i'm thinking imagine telling your team manager that you've got hurt playing football yeah um but i love it such a buzz and um so that's like a wednesday Mm -hmm. but that's seen as a down day but generally long easy cycles where i try and keep my heart rate low yeah um as um easy cardio because also helps keep the weight down and build a really good base as well yeah so then how often outside of a race weekend or a championship or whatever are you actually on the bike do you spend much time not actually really practicing no not really because it's it's mad that the cost of racing is mental mm-hmm. like to hire a circuit a good circuit privately because you can't go with club day riders and is i mean the circuits we ride at some of them are like 15 grand a day to go to Goodness then me. we've got a team of 40 staff so then you're taking 40 staff for a two-day test somewhere it's flights hire cars hotels food it's like big budget so yeah. we're only allowed to keep costs down all world championship teams are only allowed to test 10 days during the season mm-hmm. so um we have two days left now um 10 days between the end of one season and the end of the next. And you split that however you want. So you do like two days a year. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. So um, at the last one, we only rode one day. We were supposed to do two, but we rode one to save one Mm because we might put another one in somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, So aside from 13 races a year um, and 10 days, we don't ride a lot. That's crazy. So it is, but you don't get to, there is a lot of, it's a lot more training. I ride my motocross bike a lot. I still ride motocross because I love it. It's good yeah. fun. And it is a great, it's also a sport that I can get my heart rate as high. Yeah. And mentally it's good because the track's always changing. Um, That's good training. But um, aside from that, yeah, it's just physical training. Mm-hmm. But it's tough because it's like, it's like in football, I guess. I can only liken it to football where you're not, there's so many sports that you peak once a year for or twice a year for maybe you have three events per year mm-hmm. um you know we're racing every other weekend really yeah so you always have to be on it you you don't really feel and i'm even in the off season i think oh i always get anxiety of letting myself go you mm-hmm. know like putting too many yeah. kilos on because then especially now it's really hard to get off you know i've got a bit of a a weight that i'll you know a happy weight that i think it's perfect for me. And if I'm not in and around that, you know, if I let myself go, I've got a big family. <laughs> yeah. I know. And I do enjoy um, a beer myself. But if the off season and the wheels fall off, I'm, you know, it's going to be really, really tough. Yeah, it's hard to make it. I mean, I think we all fall into that. Like, I mean, my off season's coming up. I mean, I've been injured this year anyway for the whole season. But like, that's something that I've had to think a lot about this year yeah. is like, how do I get that balance right? Because when I'm playing every week, it's kind of, you can be a little bit 
sort of more, you know, you're burning more calories so you can eat more. But obviously I've not been training this year really to the level that I would normally be. So I've had to really think about it and you can really, it can really consume you. It can, yeah. but there's, there's, there, like you say, it's balance. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought, you know, when I had, when Tars was pregnant, I thought, oh fuck, here it goes. My career's over. You know, I've got kids. Yeah. yeah. How can I, um, how am I going to, it's team manager's worst nightmare, imagine. And then when it just brought much more calm to my life, I was less obsessed about the stupid things that you would think about, mm -hmm. about the diet stuff or the weight, because you were just more consumed because you've got another human to look after. Yeah. You didn't have time to spend on internet forums, finding out what people were saying about you or tr Google translating the German reporter's piece about you, you know, all this yeah. stuff, you, you had no time. So I figured that helped. And then, um, you know, I, I'd let go of a lot of stuff and it's not the right way, but I feel like now I've found a wee bit of a balance. Mm -hmm. I, um, I had a good friend that traveled with me and I started doing the world championship and I always had this rule that I wouldn't drink two weeks before a race. And I don't know if that's, you know, some people that's like too much. Some people that's like, he's, he shouldn't be drinking at all in the season. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we got home from doing this endurance race and unchampionship race in Suzuka. It's an eight hour race. You do it with a teammate. And we got back. It was Silverstone was the following weekend and I was wrecked, jet lagged. And we were in the hotel and it was Tuesday night before Silverstone. And he says, do you want a glass of wine with dinner? I was like, no, oh, mate, race this weekend. He goes, it's Tuesday. <laughs> Loosen up a glass of wine. Well, I couldn't stop at a glass, could I? <laughs> <laughs> two, two bottles at dinner. And then I don't know what time I got to bed, but I was, I woke up the next day on Wednesday morning. I thought, I've fucked my season. How, I'm, you know, on Wednesday, you know, I was racing on Sunday. Yeah. I don't know, I had the best weekend ever. So <laughs> that's, that's not the key, but the lesson was, listen, it's a lot of it is mental. You know, mm -hmm. if, if you build up these wee hurdles in your brain, or if I do this, this will happen. Or if I don't do this, this will happen. You've got so many life coaches now, especially with social media telling you the right way, yeah. this, but it's the right way for you. For you, yeah. Everybody's different. And you know, what works for me might not work for my teammate. And um, I just feel like with where I am in my life now, I've got a really good balance. Mm -hmm. So um, it was a it was a column I wrote, read from a motocross rider back in the day about diets and whatnot. He says, listen, sometimes you just want some ice cream and that there's nothing wrong with wanting some ice cream. Yeah. And, um, you know, that that philosophy kind of is what I've been running with for the last years and years. And <laughs> <laughs> I do I do like ice cream, the old the old Oreo ice cream. And then um, I was sort of wondering about like coaches there, like how much involvement do they have or is it very much the onus is on you to kind of you you teach yourself almost or where do coaches kind of fit in in terms of obviously in the gym you've got a strength and conditioning coach but for bikes like do you just figure it all out yourself so this was the latest fashion now to come into bikes everyone has everyone top riders have they have their own coach valentino rossi one of the the greatest of all times he he invested himself and had a coach and I never really had, um, even strength and conditioning coach, believe it or not, my previous team could not give two hoots what I did from Sunday after the race to the next, next, next Friday before the next race. You know, I never got phone calls, never a Dutch team I and the great, great people, mm -hmm. uh, a great team. You know, I won a lot of races with them, had fun, but the, the lack of care and attention for the rider was non-existent it was yeah. non-existent it was it was mental you know i also i made some i always thought you know i'm not even going to turn up to the first test of the year in january I'm just gonna leave it and then when they ask where i am you know the first day i said well i haven't heard from anyone. <laughs> you know they just they'd, they'd send the schedule of where they were going but never check up yeah and now with um a spanish team uh, i ride for now they're almost polar opposite you know, they, um, we work with um, the Barcelona football team doctor and we're constantly having blood tests and DEXA scans and mm -hmm. he's not obsessive. The team manager, he's also a bit of a, not an athlete, but he's very athletic himself. 
fancies himself as a tennis player and <laughs> he's the Catalan downhill, I don't know what they call it, skier. Is it Salem or Salem, yeah, Salem whatever? Let's go with that. Anyway, he's, <laughs> he's very competitive. Um, so he actually, before my contract's always been done, but the latest teammate, one of my latest teammates wasn't that great with the body fat test. So my now teammate, Alex, got this performance clause in his contract about, you know, making his, his body fat. You have to be a certain being, percentage. you know, under 10%, let's yeah. say, which is tough, you know. Dex is, you know, you put calipers on somebody, you can get a nice low rating, mm -hmm. but there's no lion on no the lion. Yeah. yeah. Dex is scan. <laughs> and um, he's, he's, he's blitzed it. You know, he's a really good athlete, but um, they're so invested in you, mm -hmm. and constantly calling you and whatnot, and you get a lot of feedback. But um, the actual riding coach, I thought after my, I won a championship in 2015, I thought, oh, this is it. This is, is that a world? Yeah, world Is that your first one? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, this is as good as it's ever going to be. Mm -hmm. It's like starting to panic, right? I need, I need a coach to be trackside to try and help me with what I can do better. My center of gravity on the bike was quite, I'm quite lazy as a rider. You know, I, not lazy, efficient. But, so, <laughs> you know, I make the bike, you know, I'm in the least energy. I save energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've got an economical riding style, let's say. <laughs> But my center of gravity is very high on the bike and the new school riding technique is elbow on the ground and head very low. And I asked Fabian for a good friend. I spent a summer in Melbourne with him, living with him and his his wife. And um, he was retiring. I thought, would you fancy coming alongside? And now he's, he's found a really good role with me and the team that I think I would love to do after bikes, you know, mm -hmm. um, with somebody else competitive or... You know, helping people, yeah. whether it even be, um, I say I was crap at football, but even coaching kids at football, I think there's so much reward helping somebody and seeing, you know, a direct result from mm. a few bits of information. That you've done, yeah. yeah. Like I remember a few times, one of the, the best, my teammate, previous teammate years ago was always very good at the home race in Donington Park in England. And... Um, he was Mr. Donington Park. His name was Tom Sykes. I could never win. And Fabian gave me a couple of like key points for Donington that transformed my weekend and I won. And it's just times that I think, well, that was, that's invaluable. Because mm -hmm. the result turned around. You get bonus for that. But, and then it all offsets. You think, well, it's so worth investing in yourself, you know, yeah. or, and going that extra mile because you feel like there's a, there's a reward for it. Yeah. So, want to touch on then the World Superbike Championships, and so the first one was twenty fifteen. Yep. What was the process of getting you to there, or was that like, well, how did I manage to just win a World <laughs> Championship? So, um, I, I started off in that junior team in England, and after three years, after my injury, I came back and rode that superbike, and after two years, I finished runner up in the the British Superbike Championship. Which was incredible. In fact, the British Championship is standalone, amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got great media coverage. Riders are paid very well, professional riders, and there's not really much onus to take a gamble in your career and go to the World Championship because, you know, everyone was a household name at home. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to go to the World Championship, be a world champion. And um, a Honda team, this um, Dutch Honda team, gave me the opportunity to go and ride in the the 600 cc class now that's like the support class to superbikes um and i just wanted to go and ride a superbike i've been riding them in the uk and mm -hmm. the team were like no listen just do a year learn in the circuits and if you're good enough we'll give you the superbike ride so after um after that year i was doing really really well i finished runner up in the world in my first year in super sport and they gave me the superbike ride and within within um six races I've been in Superbike I won a world championship race Amazing. I won two in my my rookie year in Superbike and I thought that's when I really thought you know I could this could be good you know I, yeah. I'm not just okay I could be really good yeah Um, there was heroes I was racing with you know Aussie rider Troy Bayless was like my hero 
And um, then I started to take it more serious. You know, it was became, um, you know, getting paid well. But I never seen, I never seen the pressure. It was always still fun. Like yeah. I was, now I'm not, I don't feel old, but I still get excited. I'm flying tomorrow night to um, Amsterdam to go up to Assen. But I get excited about it. You know, yeah, I get yeah. excited about packing my bag to go. And <laughs> that's, um, that's still really cool. It doesn't feel like a job because I've always tried to keep it fun. Every team I've gone to, I've tried to create like a wee family environment, you know, yeah. where, it's, where it's fun. But the years at Honda were tough. The bike was never really got developed. I was there six or seven years in Superbike. It was never really developed that fast. And, um, you know, I made the decision to, they always looked after me very well. I had great contracts, but I decided to go with Kawasaki, a great bike. Mm -hmm. they, I kept, I rang them. I actually rang the team manager, not begging, but like, listen, put me on your bike. I've, I was always very lucky that everyone talked about me in high esteem. So give me a chance to prove myself. And um, the first year there was like no budget for a, a decent rider. And then I called them again halfway through. My management were calling them. And um, I called my manager and says, listen, do not mess this up this time. <laughs> like whatever offers on the table, we take it. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that. And um, yeah, I never looked back. Like first year was flawless. The bike was incredible. Is this your first year of the Superbike? No, the first year with Kawasaki. It was after yeah. six years in Honda. Okay. So a bit like, I say a bit like, I do feel if I had to give you a quantity, I would say 70% is rider and 30% and is machinery. Right, right, okay. Much, um, much more rider than you would find, for example, in F1, mm -hmm. if you put Lewis Hamilton in one of the best drivers of all time, in the worst car, he's never going to win. Yeah, yeah. You know, in Superbike, you know, your stars can align, you can make it happen at times, but the machine's also very important. So, um. Yeah, with Kawasaki, they were great. And I had that opportunity and grabbed it with both hands. And then then it was tough because you're the reference and there's that pressure. But it just, it, when you built momentum, it was almost like a snowball and it was just happening. Yeah. It was happening, I don't want to say easy because it sounds disrespectful, but it was naturally just happening. Yeah. And now this year, or last year, I start, started facing some difficulties already, you know, because the bikes, more manufacturers are coming with, you know, increased effort yeah. and we need to really step up. It's becoming difficult. And I'm thinking, I didn't realize like how it was, you know, three years ago, we were just, you know, you were winning for fun yeah. and you thought nothing of winning three world championship races on a weekend and having a great time. And you wish, I wish I'd enjoyed that even more because tough times are, are actually tough in motorsport. I find, because from a young age racing, it was like you win or you lose. Right. There was nothing in between. Mm -hmm. And the feeling finishing second, I couldn't even, I might as well have crashed or lost. Yep. There was that euphoric high or the incredible low. Mm -hmm. And um, and now it's trying, when things are tough and you're finding, uh, you know, mechanically tough as well from the bike, you're trying to find ways to enjoy it in tough times but it's bloody hard, hard yeah. when you've been used to winning and and your mentality's like that um and yeah we this year we've had a really tough start to you i crashed in indonesia in the second round we go to the third round now in ass and it's a track they've been great at so i'm like reset you know this mm -hmm. has to to be a good weekend for us yeah and there was that period where you were so dominant for a few years mm -hmm. like you said it just seemed like you were winning everything and you were you were unstoppable, but then wasn't it when you were going for your seventh? Seventh, yeah. In tw was was twenty twenty two. Twenty two, yeah, and I I came close in twenty two. We we lost the championship by no, not twenty two. Twenty one. Twenty one. Um, and I only lost by thirteen points. Um, but last year we got beat pretty bad. Mm. You know, I was around a hundred points from Alvaro Bautista, um, and Ducati, and um. Yeah, we need to we need to try and overturn that. You know, I'm. It comes back to this power to weight ratio. We're really tr trying to campaign on superbikes now. 
as MotoGP would be the pinnacle motorsport championship in the world, Superbikes are a championship that derives from street bikes. So basically my bike starts off life as a, a bike that a punter should be able to buy in a shop, mm -hmm. spend, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of pounds and make it into a race bike within the regulations. Okay. But you've got my bike that costs 18,000 euros in the shop and you've got the Ducati that costs 44,000 euros. So when you've got base models for that or a different mm -hmm. like polar opposites, yeah. if you like, it's very hard to compete under such strict rules that you can't change internal parts. Yeah. Um, so, we're, and my the the main rival Alvaro is like fifty something, fifty seven kilos. Goodness me! So yeah. in a straight, not just his bikes fast, but in some straights they can take like zero point four of a second just in a straight line. Mm -hmm. So the only place to make that up is like on the brakes or a corner speed, and but there's only so fast you can go yeah. without going over the limit. And he is a very good rider as well. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where we're we're facing difficulties with that at the minute. Um, so um, yeah, tough times, but hopefully we can. This we get the track this weekend is not so much top speed; it's more fast and flowing and big balls. So right. <laughs> <laughs> try and throw them out there and get stuck in. Um, I wanted to talk to you about pressure because you said obviously you know your first sort of world championships that you were winning. You know it was fun. Do you feel pressure now? Um, pressure not, I don't know if I don't feel, I obviously put a lot of pressure on myself Yeah, mm -hmm. and you do, you know, you do feel it sometimes when you understand the business side of the sport, mm -hmm. because being lucky, you know, you ride the high and you're doing well, nothing ever seems hard, but you start quantifying you know, who pays for this and what are they budget for them sponsors like cost this much. And you think, well, this is a, this is a business, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, I can't just turn up and enjoy this as my hobby. It's. <laughs> I have to perform or you go there on the weekends and you know guests are coming with suits and the important people and you're thinking boy this is it's actually a big deal mm -hmm. a bit of pressure from that but I don't think it it's more pressure than I put on myself mm -hmm. and that's just because my expectation level is so high you know of myself so I get really disappointed um and that's where my team help you know in tough times they've been incredible because they to keep your the mood high in yeah. the camp and I think that's a lot you know in sport you know mentality in any sport confidence I mean I almost think motorbike racing you have to have a level of talent of course but I do think most of it's confidence mm -hmm. like if I I feel like if I had not hours but days with you pair on a motorbike and told you the ABCs of break here and you tip in at this point and you gas at this point and then I could just inject you with all my confidence. You would that be... That would be a, a sight. <laughs> me and you. And the world. You would be, like, you would be so be fast. Parallel parking. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not the same thing, but just Simone sometimes in a car. Yeah. The car does everything. My, uh, my car does everything for me, so I would be no good on that. <laughs> you press the button and it just parks itself. I wish. Fair sure enough. <laughs> <laughs> oh no that's that is crazy yeah, you know, well, that it's just you know confidence is what what well, you have you. to be confident surely to get on one in the first place surely no but sure it's like the story when i started at three years old you don't you don't actually think i'm getting onto a bike that goes 50 miles an hour yeah. when you're mm -hmm. seven it's normal has there never been fear crept in uh you say that and i try and say no but I feel like when my, I can only liken it to, and this sounds really cheesy, mm -hmm. but when I put my leathers on and my helmet on, it, it feels like you've turned into that superhero, yeah. the Marvel character or yeah. Superman. Because outside of that, sometimes I think, you know, I've like, Jake's playing football this weekend, I wish I was there. Or, fuck, if I get hurt this weekend, it's a disaster. We've got, something on this next weekend or but then the helmet comes on and you don't you think about nothing but winning and you be as and I would think my competitors would say not that I'm dirty but I'd probably be I would say another guy's more ruthless but ruthless. one of the most ruthless um 
And I do think that's what's also, I have to accept that, but I do think that's what's also put me where I am, you know, and, and give me the, you know, the accolades that I've got because I've never settled or never tried to be anything that I'm not. Um, but fear, like there's a few times I do a track walk and I think, oh, that barrier's, you know, if you go down there, that's close. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but then, yeah, the helmet goes on and that's it. Like I remember being in Imola once. Imola is the circuit where Senna died, yeah. very close to the Parkland circuit outside of Bologna. Uh, very narrow. And I'm leading the championship and I'm very good in the wet compared to most of my rivals at the time. There was a massive protest from most of the riders to, to oh, not race. Yeah. Because of the dangers, and I sat like poker faced in the front row, just staring through my visor, like with zero emotion. Didn't want to get involved in the background noise of them getting off their bikes and speaking to the, you know, the championship directors and whatnot. And I was, I was looking up afterwards, I seen what was happening on video. I thought, who is that guy? <laughs> you know, like, clearly, the easy option would be to, okay, let's race another day. Yeah. Or, you know, try and put three races on at the next round. But I was like, you know, I'm I'm good in these conditions and this is not an advantage for me, but we're here to race. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And um I do think and in life as well I see that. You know, and um day to day I'm I feel like so normal. Like I'm the school pick up dad, whatever, go out. But in a race weekend I'm different person it's like, yeah. like a like, Dorigo it is isn't it? isn't it and I do like my wife said that oh I don't know if we'll come this weekend why well, sure come it's like we'll have a good time well it's your racing and it's not the same what do you mean she says but it's, it's just different and you're different yeah no I'm not but you are you know you are that mm -hmm. person um and it's I'm very uh prepared I'm always I've got ways of doing things that in normal life I don't really care so much but on a race weekend I'm yeah a completely different person I'm sure I don't know if it's like that for you but yeah like I know what you mean in terms of like you're in a zone you're in a certain yeah. zone when you're in that moment nothing else in the world matters because yeah. you're just focused on that so you know I can kind of relate but in terms of I suppose the level of danger in your sport compared to ours is completely no but even for example pre-match or I'll have it like pre-race. Mm -hmm. I know I don't know why, but Portugal race, Portimao, just off the Algarve. Flights from Belfast, are, there's loads, there's Aer Lingus, EasyJet, probably Ryanair's even going there now. But it's full of people from here. Mm -hmm. And you see them in the paddock just pre-race. And you like you'd be going from your motorhome to the to the team truck. And sometimes I'm like, you can't stop because you stop for one person, you're oh, you yeah. stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you feel I'm such a dick, you know, yeah. for, for driving past here yeah. and or just a little side wave. But any other, then I would go and visit a race. That I know someone I'm like, what is this dick doing? Like, <laughs> last week we were, you know, we we're having dinner together. Now he just drove past me or yeah. something like that. So I find myself times like that. But it's um, it's how it is. My teammate, I always was jealous of my teammate for when he would put on his leather. So we get changed in the team offices like we have our own little office in the trucks and he would come out and generally with Tenseda barriers between the back of the trucks and the garages and in busy races it would be you know full of people you know like say two or three deep well I I've, I don't know if it's stage fright or anxiety or whatever but when my helmet's on on the racetrack I'll celebrate like Ronaldo you know what I mean <laughs> but when my helmet's off I'd, I do feel a, I do suffer from a bit from um not anxiety, but I do have that wee bit of a feeling where he had the bravado. He'll come out and he'll stop and he'll sign everything. And the meet and greets afterwards, he's got such charisma. I'm, yeah. I'm more Relaxed. calm or yeah. reserved. Yeah. And I think part of that's also growing up here. I do find people from yeah. here are much more reserved than our English counterparts. Yeah. yeah. Um, But like I say, I win a race with my helmet on, like I'll milk it. Yeah. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> As soon as it comes off, I'm um, yeah. It's back to you. Think about the next race, and you're Mister Serious again. Yeah, yeah. 
It's just fascinating. It, it is. Yeah. Honestly, it is. And what do your family feel about it? Like, what does your wife feel think, about the whole risk element and, you know, fear for them and stuff? I don't know. It's, it's tough. I think it's very tough for partners um, because they're... There's so much sacrifice goes on to make me the best I am. You know what I mean? Like I've missed friends, weddings, mm -hmm. birthday parties, yeah. you know, important days for our kids as well, like landmarks because I've been traveling and you can't get away from that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It's what you sort of sign up to. And they know that, but it doesn't stop it from being hard. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, my wife, she's, um, because I'm not there a lot, it's so tough on her. She doesn't work a nine to five, but she's she's looking after our family because I'm not there. I mean, we have bickering. She'll say she'll over exaggerate that I'm away eighty percent of the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I'll calculate the days. But genuinely, I, I counted up um, two seasons ago. I spent ninety nights away from them. That wasn't away because they travelled to quite a few races. Okay. I was ninety. 90 90 or 100 nights away from them. That's a third of the year, do you yeah. know what I mean? And when I'm home, I'm fit to be home and help her, but she's also, it is like being a single mom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's all because I want to be good at my sport. But what about her? Do you know what I mean? She's yeah. also got an identity and that that maybe she's lost or that she's now um, chasing. So that part of it is hard. So I think she finds it hard from that point of view. For my racing, I know she enjoys it, but I know she can't. She can't watch, you know what I mean? She's she'll watch on TV, but there'll be times that she can't watch or yeah. she knows the way I'm riding, if things are tough, that you think, Oh, this, anything could happen, you know what I mean? Um my kids love it, but they're um they're a bit not glory hunters. If I don't do well, they, there's no interest. <laughs> and they're quite yeah, there's nothing brutally honest about yeah. it, you know, after the race. Well, boys, <laughs> how'd football go today? Yeah, we won, or we. But this happened. It's just, what happened today, Dad? <laughs> <laughs> I, I was tough, mate. I got a bad start. And, yeah, you must have. You must work on them because, like, you need to win. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Ruthless. So yeah. they, they are, and kids are brutally honest. So you, I get it. I get it in the neck from them. And the youngest one's not interested unless I do well. So the older one's got a wee bit more maturity. He knows what's going on. <laughs> I've and I find like even if you're. Even when you're home, then sometimes you struggle to be totally present, present because your mind is elsewhere about what's coming up or what's just happened yeah. or, you know, you can't fully let go and, you know, socialize. Yeah. Well, we can't go here and we can't go out and do all of this. So and they're still missing out even if you are there physically, yeah. but you're not there. Can you switch mentally. off? Well, no, my wife diagnosed me with that anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I've got personality disorder with <laughs> just not being present and... I, I am a bit of a disaster for that and I'm trying to work on it. But I do feel, maybe not all sports people, because I do find a lot of really normal sports people, but that aren't that, not say not that aren't that special, but they're not different. Yeah. You mm -hmm. know, people that have done well are actually quite different in their own ways. So that's what I say to you anyway. And um, and she, she's got her own issues going on. So we work really... <laughs> Like we work a lot of office jets, you know. <laughs> we work really, really well together. Um, but yeah, she'll say I'm um I'm not present and I lose my concentration. And I do have very short concentration span. Like I feel like like just trying to sit down and watch a box set. Oh, I'm the like same. Exactly. Now with my bloody mobile phone. Yeah. Like and so much going on. I think we've just got too much information yeah. at us yeah, nowadays. Yeah. Um where she can get absorbed, fully absorbed in something and and I do think women are much better at multitasking. So I'll not hear something going on here, but it's because I'm fully focused on doing this job right. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll get up in the morning and she's got like the washing done, breakfast half done, the car wants to be washed, then this is needs to be hung out, school uniforms are here, where I'll have to first start my breakfast. Because when I'm once when I do my breakfast task, then I can move on to the washing. The next thing. And then the next one. <laughs> then the day's done. <laughs> so, yeah. so I'm I'm quite I'm quite simple like that. But um, yeah, I do think sports people are a wee bit just different in that aspect. We're wired differently. Yeah. Maybe. But I wish I was more present. You know, some of my mates are much better friends to me than I am to them. Um, and I think, but I also find as well, 
and it's very selfish, but it was Lewis Hamilton's, one of Lewis Hamilton's first, I don't know how many books he's got, but I read his first book and he talked about something about saving energy. You know, like life just consumes energy, like you reading your phone consumes energy or you're giving your time to somebody is energy mm -hmm. that could be for you, for you know, self-improvement, whatever it be, rest, recovery. And I find that I'm very good at that. You know, very good at saving energy where, where she's like everybody's best friend and her best mates and yeah. therapist and this and that. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm being selfish or just clever. <laughs> but, <laughs> do you know what I mean? I think that's what you do. You save energy, not replying to me. Is that what it is? <laughs> I'm a disaster on mobile phones, getting back to people really bad. I'm good at timekeeping. Mm -hmm. That's one good thing. This first team manager had great, great story. When I was 16 or 17, the Honda boss, old school, ruthless. He says, do you need, do you need to lift the track in the morning? I says, yeah. And he says, right, we're leaving at half seven. No, I'm leaving at half seven. So I thought, meant breakfast at seven. And I, I love sleep. So it was like, it was literally seven alarm clock, five past seven and close, 10 past seven at breakfast, breakfast. I'm in the lobby at half past seven. Neil, are you here? I've left, Jonathan. I told you I was leaving at half past seven. <laughs> like, <laughs> absolutely ruthless. But it was such a life lesson. Yeah. Like 30 quid. It was in the North England somewhere up near Darlington. And it was like 30 quid to get to the to the track. I was like, oh, no way. But it was a good life lesson to learn. Yeah, yeah. So time keeping I'm good with, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not a multitasker. <laughs> I we always say this thing in work that early is on time, on time is late, is late. late is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. That was always well. I always time. find, of course, you're always going to be late, and there's always reasons yeah. for being late. But I find, for example, I would have, we agreed to meet here today at twelve or half twelve, mm -hmm. but I text you a time it was going to be twelve. But if I had got to eleven fifty nine and I was stuck in traffic, I would have texted to say. I might be a wee bit late, but that could have been two minutes late. Yeah. But um, you have a teammates in the past are a disaster. And then that it really annoys you when you're on time for stuff. <laughs> yeah. And then oh, the one teammate was so late for stuff. It really pissed me off like, really badly. <laughs> so I'm a stickler for time, but yeah. <laughs> um, oh, teammates pretty... was another thing that I wanted to ask about. So when you watch Formula One, there's always a real interesting dynamic, obviously, between teammates. They're either like look like they're really good pals or they're like in competition with each other and it's that dy dynamic of like trying to help the team but also their individual interests yeah, is it the sense. same with yep and it'd be the same for you as well that's um but my current teammate and i really get on with them because all you want is respect mm -hmm. yeah. you know i mean if yeah. you've got respect and there's an, a decent atmosphere you, you don't have to be their best mate right where the one yeah. i have now his name's alex and he's um, he's English, so it helps. Language is yeah. free flow, yeah. and everything's good. Um, similar position with me. He's just a couple of years younger than me, but got a wife. He's got twins. He's just had twins last year, so he's been super busy. Mm -hmm. um, and he's a good dude. You know, what I mean, he's somebody because we spend a lot of time together. There's race weekends, but then there's all the other PR and marketing events you have to go to, and generally and. You could be in hotels in Jakarta or anywhere in the world, US, wasting a day and your your teammate's the only guy around. Mm -hmm. So you're hanging out, yeah. it's coffee and then uh, do you want to go for dinner? Where Alex is actually, I really enjoy his company. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there's been teammates in the past that are, don't respect you, even as a person or rider or, like I had a teammate before that was, if I said left, he would say right. Yeah. If, if I think the bike should be like this he would he would make me out why i'm wrong instead of listen this is just my way you know have your way but don't don't try and belittle what i'm doing mm -hmm. so there's never um a good relationship with that guy but generally teammates are i guess it's it's all good until you're maybe battling for a world title yeah head or, head or, or, something, yeah. or a race win or you know, funny one with alex my current one in indonesia I mean, I can't remember the last time before this race. I was ninth in a race, but I was ninth. And I overtook him in the last lap to be ninth. But it was a pretty shitty pass, to be honest. I came from far and 
we didn't touch or anything, but I went a bit wide and he went wide. But that's the ruthlessness for me with the helmet yeah. on. Like I didn't, of course he's my teammate and I wasn't going to try and do anything stupid. But after he was fucking fuming, we got back to Park <laughs> Fermi and he was shouting and screaming. And I just went over to him and put my arm on his shoulder. I said, listen, mate, I'm sorry, but I'm also battling for position myself. He said, yeah, but he almost took me out. He has got a hot temper. <laughs> I've seen him. We're both walking back. It was so hot. We're both walking back to, we're like ice baths out the back of the garage. So he was like strundling off like four steps in front and I wasn't completely satisfied with my apology. So I was, I was like sort of like creeping up on him again. Another arm around the shoulder. Listen, dude, come on. You've got to understand this. And then I had a bit of a hissy fit myself, just the state of the bike and, Scratching around for ninth place was yeah. Yeah. for me too. And um and then after it were men, you know, he, he can also then switch off. Yeah. Oh, that's good. So it, it takes a wee bit more than the checkered flag to simmer him down, but he does calm down. Yeah, it's there eventually. <laughs> there's 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 clearly a rivalry. And um yeah, I imagine it'd be the same in football with people in that position your same position or whatnot, because you're you're clearly teammates, but rivals as well yeah well, equally like yeah you know fighting to get on the starting team you know there's people yeah. that have to be left out and yeah it's... because there's people don't understand and people don't understand but it's it's your livelihood mm -hmm. you know what i mean and there's like it's money involved and if you do better than the other one you know it makes a big difference mm -hmm. you know what i mean so there's whilst your teammate i can be happy for him having a good day but if he has a good much better day than me every day it's not this is not what you want. Yeah. It's not what you want. You can be happy for them, but it's you're disappointed as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of wrapping up the podcast, then we were just asking everyone if you could, you know, give us your greatest career highlight, what would you say it would be? Good question. I think it's hard to know. There's been so many. Yeah. You know, I think winning my first world championship, even my first world sort of bike race yeah. was incredible. Because mm -hmm. not that I think everyone in this world suffers from self-doubt at times. And whilst it's your dream to be very good, mm -hmm. until you've actually achieved something you want to do, it's, you know, it's a pipe dream. Yeah. Or it's unreal. Like, you come from, I come from Lauren. I want to be a world motorbike champion. <laughs> 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 Go and, go and get yourself a tractor and help out your mate there. You know what I mean? That's what. So I felt like when I won my first World Superbike race, and it was against like a real legend of Superbike, Nori Haga, a Japanese guy. And I thought, oh, this is like, can't get much better. Mm -hmm. um, and then winning a championship in 15 was icing the cake. So I, I dreamed of being a world champion. I thought it was going to be a motocross. Mm -hmm. so probably um that would be my career highlight in, in 15 and then i've had a lot of success after that so that was all like a bonus yeah you know but that was um yeah incredible because i felt good felt like um i achieved everything i ever wanted to mm -hmm. but there's so many stuff outside of sport in 17 i got um i got an mbe so i got to go to buckingham yeah. palace that was like so surreal yeah I bet. mental yeah. <laughs> um and um Second place at the sports, sports personality. Oh, yeah, yeah. sports yeah. personality. Oh, that night. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know why. They said they said to me, um, it's a big glitzy. I wasn't the biggest fan, right? Because I think it came here one year or it came. To, it did, yeah. yeah, it did. yeah, yeah. Or, I don't know where it was, but I was always invited uh -huh. for, for years and years. And I asked for a guest pass, like a ticket for my wife to go, you know, because it's a great night out. Yeah. And also, I feel I'd be dead nervous, you know, sat in the crowd with somebody of no idea who was. Yeah. And um, they always said no. It's like the amount of money they spend at that event. Surely they can put another seat. <laughs> anyway, it says, listen, you're you're nominated now. You're in whatever it was. There's 12 people at the time. And um, it says, would you ride your bike into the stadium? <laughs> I was like, probably not ride my race bike, but I could. I rode a standard like Kawasaki from the shop in. But the angle they got on the stage was so tight. I thought, <laughs> like, tight for me yeah. in a bloody suit as well. And, and this was like, and I went during the day and like casuals and it was like, no problem. But 
I couldn't really hear what was going on because I had a helmet on, health and safety and all. And then they were like, go, go. I was like, oh, I'm not. And I rode in to the, uh, Liverpool, it was the Echo Arena. And it was full. And I remember um, going down thinking, oh, I know them. He's off the TV. He's like, oh, fuck, here comes this ramp. <laughs> <laughs> so just get up the ramp. And this, on my bike doesn't have a stand. It has like, it's got two wee lugs on the swing arm that you put an actual external stand on. I had half forgot that this thing has like a side stand, like I know, like an old road bike side stand. Yeah. So I thought, oh, I got to put the stand on. I was getting my leg off. I was like, I'll oh, put the stand on quick. Got the stand on. And then like hyperventilating my nerves. when they're, I can't even remember what they're asking me. Did you even take the helmet off? <laughs> Just keep it on. <laughs> no, but they, they were like, they, they were, they, they insured everybody. And um, mine was great. And then they were doing the results at the end. And I was there literally for a free drink night out in the night BBC out. after a long, tough year. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it was my end of season. I thought, brilliant. And when I got nominated, not only did I get like one ticket for my wife, like a load of my mates were in the crowd as well. So it was a great night out. Yeah. But um, me and her in the front row and she can't stop voting for me on her phone. And I'm like, listen, <laughs> oh, put that away. <laughs> Fuck it. What's her name? The skiers or the skaters. Uh, Him and her. Torval and Dean. Dean, yeah. So they're like right beside us. I'm like, Put your phone away. <laughs> like refresh and boat again. And Anthony Joshua was there. I'm like, we're like amongst so many cool people. Stop boating for me. But that's brilliant. Um they read out third place and it was um Johnny Peacock, the Paralympian. Mm -hmm. And um I thought, oh when it said J, J, I was like, oh, that's that's no chance, no worries. I'll have a good night. And then they read me out second. I was like, no way. <laughs> I was like fumbled and I got up there. It was um it was pretty amazing to be fair. But it's it's weird that that whole production I got blown away by TV because the whole night we were didn't move us to be oh they did move us they were moving people. So if you watch the show closely in the future, you'll see the camera panning down and there'll be a different person on the end of the aisle that was there like five minutes ago, <laughs> just because that person needs to be seen. Yeah. I guess on the TV. But, um, yeah, what a great night. Brilliant. Amazing. Love that. That's class. Uh, honestly, I could go on, like, just learning so much about a new sport that you've never yeah. heard about before and all the pressures and, uh, like, like, what you've achieved is incredible. Oh, yeah, seen. thank you. Amazing. You and, yeah, you're a legend of your sport. I know you probably don't want to hear that all the time, but you absolutely no, are. thank you. And a legend from Northern Ireland. Well. No, I know. It's been a pleasure to have you on our little podcast. Yeah, really. thank you so much. And um, yeah, we'll have to get on a bike someday <laughs> yeah. when know, we retire. There's, there is a place, uh, not not a plug, because I've never actually been myself, but you you can try out. It's near Knott's Corner. It's called e Okay. It's like electric little indoor bikes. And they've got all the kit apparently there. And you can go up and ride around like an indoor little motocross track. That can be like a bonus segment of this episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Not. Yeah, I'm sure. Just don't tell my club that I'm doing yeah, it. Yeah, out of season, out of season. <laughs> no, well, thanks very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.